The Grey Goose, Adventures of a Modern Robin Hood. Let me introduce myself. Roland Fletcher, adventurer. Somewhat of an enigma, I'm told. An enemy of the social order? Definitely. Let me tell you, then, of the adventure that commenced with my meeting with Barbara Faversham. A lovely moonlight night on a lonely road, the powerful Daimler purring along its way to London, when... <coughs> well, well. Drama at midnight. Shots, a woman screams. Despair, agony, or triumph? I wonder which. All women scream at times, but one never knows what they're screaming about. Or... Hardly ever. <laughs> we shall pause here and contemplate the moonlit scene. Ah, moon of my delight that knows no wane. How Stick are... your hands up. What? Stick your hands up. I have a gun and it's pointing through your near side car window. Oh, so it is. I'm very uncomfortable too. Stick your hands up. All right, all right. Don't repeat yourself so often. I'm sticking my... Oh. Yes, oh. I expect your gun down. Now open that door and come in, and don't try any other stupid jokes while I get that gun. Ah, here it is. Now, with your permission, I shall resume my seat. You comfy? Oh. Good. Now, you shut the door on your side, Miss Dick Turpin, and I'll do ditto on mine. Now, we're set. Where to, Miss? Houston, Paddington, Sharon Cross, or just the loony bin? You beast. <laughs> right. I'm a beast. But I have a little excuse. I've been waylaid on the King's Highway. My life has been jeopardized by a lady's pop gun. Screams and shots in the night have upset my equilibrium. Ergo, I'm roused. I object. Ergo again, I'm a beast. And what was your object in this very unmaidenly hold-up? I want to get to London. Oh, is that all? Righto. She'll in a mile, 50 miles, two pound ten, lady, in advance. Oh. All right, now. Let's have it. What is all this about? I... I can't tell you. You must, my dear, or walk back. You see, it's not my general practice to pick up strange hitchhikers, especially when they use a gun instead of the proverbial thumb. I'm sorry I stuck the gun at you. I, I was pretty desperate. Would you mind driving on a mile or two? I, I don't think I'm very safe just hereabouts. Of course, of course. We'll get a move on. <laughs> Now, spill the beans. Oh, wait, you haven't any other guns or daggers about you, have you? Certainly not. What do you think I am? Well, frankly, I don't know. I think for my own safety I ought to search you. You wouldn't dare. <laughs> How could you stop me? I, I suppose I couldn't. Cad. <laughs> no, you couldn't. But somehow I believe you've... Um, Contributed your full quota to the disarmament policy? I assure All you. All right, I... let's cut the cackle and get at some understanding. I'm Roland Fletcher. My license is in the glove box if you want confirmation. And now, you. My name's Winnie Mayfield. Oh, thanks for your candor. I notice your handbag has the initials BF. BF, of course, standing for Winnie Mayfield. And again, of course, for something I'm too much of a gentleman to utter. You are definitely a beast. All right, then, my name's Barbara Faversham. Does that mean anything to you? Doesn't even ring a bell. Wait, Faversham? Fa my hat, no. Yes, my father is Brian Faversham, now in Dartmoor for a term of 12 years, for fraud, gulling the public, conversion of funds, the whole lot. Oh, sorry. But he's innocent. Ah. He is, he is. He's a victim of a bunch of sly, unscrupulous rats who are now sitting back in ease and luxury while the only honest man in the syndicate has taken the... the... Rap is the word. Rap. Listen, I have letters, documents, and all sorts of things at home that can prove it. But I'm so helpless. A girl knowing nothing of big finance. I've sworn I'll get the rights of things. 
And I'm going to get every one of those men till I prove everything. One by one, they're going to pay. Hmm. Well, what do you think? For heaven's sake, say something. Brian Faversham had a fair trial. Yes, but he was the victim, the whipping boy for these men. Look at this paper. Uh, a list? Yes, a list of robbers. The 40 thieves. <laughs> Strange. What is? Barbara, you're on a losing wicket, I think. But you're a crusader in a fashion. Somehow I'm a bit your way because, you see, I'm on a similar errand. Sometime I may tell you about my fight, but not now. Here, let me stop the car a moment. But I want to get to London. All in good time, my dear. And I give you my word, I haven't run out of gas. Now tell me, what was all the shooting about back there? But before you do... Shall I tell you that among those 40 thieves, there are names in which I also am vitally interested? Did you notice one? Venner. Horatio Venner. I did. He is, was, a financial genius. Mm -hmm. And secretary of one of my father's companies. He was the owner of that house back there, Highfield Manor. And was one of the 40 thieves, too. Well, I learned that his knowledge would be useful to me. So I went down there tonight to confront him with it. And make him admit certain facts. Go on. I got to the house and was admitted. He was in his study. Why, Barbara, it is a pleasure to see you. The pleasure is not mutual, Mr. Benner. No? Definitely no, Mr. Benner. I haven't come here to exchange polite crosstalk. No? No. I've come here because I know you are in possession of documents that, if released in the right quarters, would help clear my father's name and put the rest of your gang where he is now, in jail. Now, Barbara, just think for a moment. I have thought, Mr. Venner. I see you have a safe there. Open it, now. Barbara, I... I have this gun, Venner. I shall shoot. I mean it. Very well, my dear. You shall examine the contents of my safe. I do not think there is anything that will help you in there. There you are. Please make yourself at home. Hey, oh. confound the lights. They've gone out. Who did that? All right, Benner. Thanks for the help. Barbara, but where are you, Barbara? You would not, you could not do this to me. That's it, fellas. Chuck everything in the safe into the bag. Everything. Good. Now scram. Who is it? Who's there? Who? Who? The lights. The switch. Where is it? Oh. Oh. Mr. Benner. God, they've killed him. Who? Who? A very graphic description, my dear. Did you see the uh, intruders? Oh, didn't I tell you they switched off the lights? Of course. Sorry, you did. And don't ask silly questions. No, I must remember that. And then what happened? They, or whoever it was, had crushed his head in. I screamed. Yes, I heard that. Then I let loose with my gun in the direction I thought they'd taken as I ran down the drive. Very constructive, I feel. Oh, for heaven's sake, don't be so superior. I panicked. Go on. Then the main idea in my mind was to get away, get back to London. I saw your car and... And, and tried to stand and deliver an act on me. Well, my dear girl, you picked the right one, so fortune was apparently on your side. Well, why don't you get a move on? I, I want to get back home. My dear idiot, you're not going to London or home yet. We've got to go back to that house. No, no. Yes, yes. You've left a dead man behind you, and heaven knows what other incriminating factors. We must pay a visit to Highfield Manor. Come on. But... Shut up. It's only a mile or two. Hmm. A nice kettle of fish. One dead man, coshed very severely on the napper. Come here, Barbara. I can't. Don't be an idiot. Look at this man. Yes. That's your friend, your late friend, Horatio Venner? Yes. Now, think back. This is urgent. Did you have a drink, a cigarette, or touch anything here? I... I had a cigarette. Where's the butt? Did you finish it? Yes. I... I think I put it in that ashtray. Oh, for God's sake, me from fools, and that means women. Get that butt and shove it in your purse, bag, or pocket. Good. No drinks? No. Good. No fingerprints on glasses. Did you touch anything else? Anything at all? Probably. 
The chair arm, I think. I, I was sitting here. Uh, uh, give me that silk scarf you're wearing. Uh-huh. Thank you. Now to do a bit of dusting. Must I? Must I stay and look at... at that? Yes, you must. And that can't do you any harm. So don't be squeamish. Now, cast your mind back. Have you touched anything? Anything else? No. No, no, I don't think so. Think, think, think. Don't be a fool. Have you? No. Oh, the press button, the doorbell. And the switch. Oh, marvellous. Dr. Watson, as a helpmate to Sherlock Holmes, you'll be a complete loss. All right, we can clear out from here, and as we go, wipe the jolly electric button. Okay? Okay. Now for the road, leaving one dead man, one empty house, and one more mystery for our good friends, the county constabulary. Shut the door. Of course. Can we go now? Yes. After? After what? After you wipe the bell, push idiot. What's that? That, my dear, is a grey goose feather. I'm just inserting it in your nearly incriminating bell push. Why? Why? A little conceit. A foible, if you wish, of mine. Have you ever heard of the famous cliché, Queen Elizabeth slept here? Of course. But what's that got to do with Highfield Manor and your feather? My feather means... <laughs> I have been here. Now for the road, Barbara. And thence... Who knows? And now what? Has a partnership been cemented between adventurers and a common cause? Listen again to the further adventures of that modern highwayman and gentleman adventurer, the Grey Goose. Grey Goose, Adventures of a Modern Robin Hood. Leaving Highfield Manor and the dead man, Benner, I drove Barbara to London. I was convinced that Benner's death would not affect either of us. The police files would probably read, Murder by some person unknown. <laughs> At last, we arrived at my flat. Along here, Barbara, is my flat. What's that? Someone in there? (laughs) No. As we stepped out of the lift, I switched on an alarm. As you trod on a certain board in the passage from the lift, A buzzer sounded in my flat. Very useful, my dear, when I'm in. I know someone's coming to see me. What do you think of the idea? I think you're a very mysterious man, Mr. Fletcher. (laughs) Oh, I am, I am. Well, here we are. Come in. My, but how beautiful. I'm glad you like it. It's charming. Good. You see, you're probably going to see a lot of it. Oh, that lovely cloisonne vase. Priceless. Yes, a beauty. I managed to um, <laughs> acquire that from the Delaware collection. But that collection was entirely stolen from the galleries. Exactly. What are you? Who are you? Roland Fletcher, at your service, Barbara. Freelance adventurer. And thief. And thief. Oh, true. Tis true, tis pity, pity tis, tis true. Let me go. I don't want to have any more to do with you. Thank you for the lift. Please let me leave. Willingly. But hold the horsepower, my dear, and think. What of that dead man in Highfield Manor? The shots and the screams. Who's to say you didn't knock Horatio Venner to, for six yourself? No one on earth knew I was going there. What of the hire car, Johnny? He put me down a mile from the place. I walked the rest of the way. <laughs> Clever girl. Oh, by the way, you'd better powder your nose. You're beginning to shine a bit, darling. Oh, I... Good heavens. What's to do now? I've lost my compact. It's not in my handbag. Of course it isn't. 
Do you use it and drop it in Horatio Venner's study at Highfield Manor? Oh, I must have done. How very convenient for the local constabulary. But no, the gods were on your side, my dear. For the gods, substitute Roland Fletcher. I picked it up. Name engraved and fingerprints and all. Here. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Stop wailing. You remind me of a wall in Jerusalem. Now you see, my dear, how very necessary I am to you. Yes. Good. Now, let's get down to brass tacks. You are aiming to collect evidence from certain individuals who you think landed your daddy in jail. I know I can do it. I know you can't. You've made an unholy mess of the first attempt with Horatio Venner. You've left a dead man in Highfield Manor entirely unaccounted for. Couldn't you even grant the darkness see a thing? No, nothing. Could you recognize the voice that told the others to pick up everything and, um, uh, uh, scram? I... I was so excited, and the terrible moment of his death left me so scared. I hadn't time to recognize anything. <laughs> I can understand that. All right, we've nothing to go on yet. But doesn't it seem strange to you that the very night you choose to visit Horatio Venner, his assassins arrive, rifle the safe, and leave you with a dead man on your hands? My heavens! What do you mean? I mean, idiot, that you must have spilled a bean or two somewhere, and someone very interested went for what you went for. And very cleverly left you holding the baby. If... if you hadn't insisted on turning back. <laughs> but I did. And so the late Horatio Venner and his death cannot be connected with you. Thank you. But, and but, and but, who knew you were going a visiting tonight? Who did you ask to help you? Who got you the hire car? Who and who and who? Think, woman, think. I hired the car... Derek Morgan arranged it for me. Derek Morgan? Who's he? He was one of my father's secretaries. A young... Young, handsome and charming. My hat they were. Was the car chauffeur driven? Yes, but... But me no buts. Morgan probably knows all about the affairs that culminated in your father's trouble. Oh, of course. And he's been most sympathetic and helpful on so many occasions. I repeat, idiot, idiot, idiot. Well, I suppose poor Derek has to be eliminated. And I think I know how. Eliminated? But you don't think he was in any way to blame? I don't think anything, except that Derek has to be eliminated. Now, to get to business. Uh, come over here. Uh, this is a bookcase. Uh-huh. Now, observe. I turn a little switch, so... I don't even have to say open sesame, but it opens just the same. Regardez-vous. Proceed through the opening. Why? Another charming flat. Exactly. Mine. Uh, Mr. Jenkins rents it. Actually, his name is on the post boxes downstairs. Mr. Jenkins is uh, me. Or, <laughs> should I say, I. You have two flats, then? Indeed, yes. But see here. The entrance door to this flat leads to the back of the block. My door leads to the front. But why two flats? The explanation will come later. Just think this one out. Mr. Roland Fletcher comes in at the front. If, however, Mr. Jenkins wishes to go out to the back, it's simple. But why? Why? Who are you and why is all this necessary? Shall we leave that till later? Now, here's my scheme. You shall take over Mr. Jenkins' flat. Your name shall be placed on the post box downstairs. You mean... <laughs> I mean nothing you can take exception to. Your flat is yours, mine is mine. There's certainly nothing between us, uh, except a bookcase. But that locks on your side as it does on mine. My only means of wishing to see or communicate with, um, Mr. Jenkins is a buzzer. You can then come to me when I buzz, or I can come to you when you release the catch on your side. Why should you do all this for me? <laughs> Heaven knows. But I think you may prove very useful. You see, Barbara, you're waging a war. I too have a war on, so we have a common cause. You've helped me wonderfully, and I'm grateful. Are you on? Yes, I'm on. Shake, partner. And now for Derek Morgan and Operation Elimination. You wouldn't harm him? Well, no, but he has to be silenced. How, I don't know yet. But I don't think I trust that gentleman. He knows too much about you. Come on, the car's outside. We'll call on him. You guide me to his lair, den, or what have you. Oh, but it's two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> hurry, girl, hurry. Or it'll be three o'clock in the morning. Barbara, what is all this? You and this, this, this gentleman dig me out of bed in the small hours? What for? I'll tell you, Mr. Morgan. Or rather, you tell me. 
What were you doing driving a Lincoln Saloon card on the Great West Road tonight? Jerry! Uh, I was not. Liar. Your car was seen. You had a lady passenger, and you put her down at a certain place and ostensibly, ostensibly, turned round and went back to London. I did not. I, I went so to... So you did drive that car. <laughs> now listen to me, laddie. Within a mile or so of that spot, a man was murdered. A man well known to you. Horatio Venner. Venner? Yes, Venner. Now, what have you got to say? You're in the know, as it were, with Venner and his mob? You, like many others, had a lot on him. I only drove Bob. Ah, so you were on that road tonight near where a man was murdered. How in heaven's name Was it really you, Derek, who drove me? Of course it was. Now, there's going to be a hue and cry for the murderer of Horatio Venner tomorrow. Hadn't you better clear out before then? There's a plane to the continent at ten in the morning. Will you catch it? If you don't, Barbara can testify to the man who did the job. She was there. But I didn't do it, I tell you. You I... drove that car. <laughs> and let me tell you, the police shall get the number of it. It was seen in the neighbourhood. Then I owed you no good turn. Voila, my friend. Now think for a moment. Since Barbara's father uh, gave up business, uh, what happened to you? Sir Thomas Bradbury gave me a job with him as his secretary. Aha! Sir Thomas Bradbury. One of the syndicate that Barbara's father... Brown Pavisham was connected with. Yes. So you, um, <laughs> deserted the sinking ship. I... I have my future to think of. I... Future? My lad, you have none. Now listen. Bradbury must have confided in you to a large extent. He didn't... Don't confi- lie to me. Bradbury is one of those for whom Brian Pavisham took the knock. Well, uh, I... Shut up. Benner also knew a great deal. In fact, was in the works. And knew you knew too much. Right? He might have... So you take the opportunity Barbara offers you, and while she's doing her act with Venner, you dash in, douse the lights, bump off Venner with a tire lever or something like that, and leave her holding the baby. I, I swear... Don't trouble. <laughs> Morgan, I've got a lot on you. Think. Barbara was there. You, through your knowledge of Bradbury's business, that of Barbara's father and the rest, plus Venner, wanted to get in the clear. You have, in my opinion, got the contents of Venner's safe. Hmm? <laughs> Stand and deliver, friend. I, I swear I haven't. I... I never went up to Highfield Manor. Oh, oh, and again, oh. How did you know about the fracard Highfield Manor? Uh, Who said anything about that desirable residence for crooks and sharpshooters? I... I, Listen, uh, Morgan, uh, I don't think you killed Venner. I don't think you could kill a mouse. But everyone else would. And I shall see that the police will be thoroughly worded up on that theory. But, but, but you... There's a plane at ten in the morning, as I said, bound for European parts. Catch it, or else. Well... I, uh, I'll catch it. Good. And now, good night. Come, Barbara. Mr. Fletcher, I don't think Derek Morgan killed Horatio Venner. <laughs> Neither do I. Morgan is not the stuff that killers are made of. Excuse the half quote. Then why threaten him? Why? Because we do not require him the way when we get busy on his boss, Sir Thomas Bradbury. He's another? Obviously. We must pay old Sir Thomas a call in the very near future. And Venner? Venner is dead. I'm afraid I can't explain why, but I can say how. Horrible. Horrible. Robbery with violence will be the verdict, and the police will be, um, baffled. Yes, uh, baffled is the word. Tell me, how did you know it was Derek Morgan who drove me in that hire car? How? <laughs> Simple, my dear Watson. I mean, Barbara. He wasn't expecting visitors and forgot that he'd left a peak cap and blue uniform coat hanging in the hall of his flat. Oh. Now we have to work out how to get at Bradbury. That's the next move. Yes, Bradbury. Venner is no more. Derek Morgan, like the swallow, has uh, migrated, but will return. For the nonce, my dear, cross them off your list. Okay? Yes, Rowley. Okay. Be with us again when Roland Fletcher, modern Robin Hood, once again shoots an arrow on the road for another adventure in the story of The Grey Goose. (laughs) 
I have been here. The Grey Goose. Adventures of a Modern Robin Hood. A whole week went by subsequent to our visit to Derek Morgan, which visit ended in his um, elimination. I love that word. <laughs> by this time, I'd built up quite a reputation. Even that beehive Scotland Yard I found was becoming a little disturbed. Confounded for it! Here it is again. Read that in this morning's Times. Uh, there it is. Donations. The Gresham Private Hospital gratefully acknowledges the receipt of one thousand pounds from an anonymous donor. The money in notes was received safely. Well, was there? Yes. In the package was a grey feather. As usual. As usual. Listen, Ford. In three months, big houses have been robbed of thousands. Safes have been looted of more thousands. Dowager duchesses have lost diamonds. And in every case, mark you, a grave feather has been left behind. A token. A challenge, if you like. A challenge to whom, Super? Us. Uh, we. Uh, down. The, the public. The victim gets a grave feather, and later some darn charity or organization also gets a grave feather. Plus a fat donation. And now comes news of a grey feather stuck in the bell push at Highfield Manor and the murder of the owner. Have you identified the feather? Identified it. There are about 70 million grey feathers scattered around every week. Pigeons, hens, ducks, even flaming eagles. Oh, didn't research department reduce it to a particular brand, sir? Oh, yes. They were particularly instructive. Marvellously so. Listen, Ford, for your secret ear. Hold your breath. It's a goose feather. They said so, and that's all they could say. A goose feather? Mm, tells us an awful lot, doesn't it? There are... Seven million geese in the country. What? <laughs> Sorry, sir, I couldn't help it. All right, have your joke. Ford, I'm going to comb every darn poultry farm in the country and find out... Who's plucking geese, sir? Stop being facetious, man. Somewhere, someone is putting one over us. Scotland Yard. The public... I'll get him somehow, or I'll give up being superintendent of this division. A goose feather, sir. Well? There's something about a goose feather that I, and I suppose most of us, have forgotten until this moment. Hmm? But it's coming back to me. Well, what are you getting at, Ford? As I remember, the old bowmen of England feathered their arrows with goose feathers. The grey goose feather. <laughs> That's right. And they shot him in the air at Agincourt and defeated the French's up. There was another archer and his men, sir, who used the grey goose feather to great effect. Yes. Yes, go on, man. Robin Hood. Robin... Get mad, you've got something at last. Robin Hood robbed the rich and gave his taking to the poor. Our friend of today robs a wealthy man and some worthy cause benefits. Cast your mind back to those 13 big halls. Thirteen charities or deserving causes have been helped. The victim received a goose feather. So did the recipient every time. It's too great a coincidence to be overlooked, sir. Ford, you've almost convinced me. But such a state of affairs cannot be tolerated. We must get this uh, Robin Hood. True. He's a menace to society. He is. And I won't rest easy till we get him. Inspector Ford... You've got yourself a job. You are specifically detailed to bring in our goosey friend. Thank you, sir. I think I can. Yes? Come in, Barbara. I'll release the cash on the bookcase. Close the gadget, my dear. Never forget that. Oh. A fine thing if a caller came and found out that my bookcase, when swung out, opened into your flat. Oh, dear. Think of the scandal. I've thought of the scandal lots of times in the last week, but then you've lost so many opportunities, haven't you? Shall we say, not lost, but gone before? Before the necessity of caution in our enterprise? All right. Have it your way, Rowley. <laughs> it must be my way, Barbara. 
You and I have too much at stake to take risks. You have your axe to grind, I also. So until our combined axes have been sharpened to razor edge and they've fallen on those we've decided to uh, execute, we forget other things. Very well. What did you buzz me for? This. Here's the evening paper. Very interesting too. Listen. For months, the depredation of an unknown but very skillful thief have terrorized the city and West End. <laughs> I like terrorized, don't you? This malefactor has helped himself to thousands of pounds from unsuspecting victims, mostly those possessing jewels and well endowed in other ways with this world's goods. Whenever a victim has been robbed, a grey feather has been found placed in a prominent position. The strange element in every case has been that some charity or some seemingly deserving organisation, and in some cases private individuals, have received a very large donation. These Robin Hood tactics were all right in the year 1199, but they do not apply in this 20th century, and it would appear that this reign of lawlessness should receive the utmost attention of the police. Our reporter is given to understand that Chief Inspector Ebenezer Ford has been specially detailed by Scotland Yard to investigate these crimes and bring those responsible to justice. Well, well, well. Ben Ford, by all that's wonderful. Who is he? Anyone good? Good? He's the snake's hips and puma's bloomers as a sleuth. And just to mix things up a bit, he's an old schoolmate of mine. Oh, that's dangerous. Dangerous? Nonsense. We'll look him up in the near future. Attack, my dear, is the best form of defence, you know. Oh, here's another paragraph. Inspector Ford told our reporter that he had put two and two together and decided that the grey feathers had a significance. Oh, did he? They were more or less indicative of a character on Robin Hood lines. He himself alluded to the criminal as the grey goose. Hmm. <laughs> Very clever, Ben, very. He sounds dangerous, this man. Rowley, he seems to have been very smart off the mark about the feathers. Why not drop the feathers altogether? No fear. That's my little piece of conceit, and I like it. But, Rowley, this man, Ford, may take his feathers a step nearer. How? Grey goose feathers for arrows. Yes. Arrow makers were called Fletchers. <laughs> <laughs> and my name is Fletcher, Roland Fletcher. My dear girl, there are millions of my name in the country. I still wouldn't underestimate your friend the enemy, Inspector Ford. All right, we'll take due care. Now, Barbara, it's just 9pm and we have a chore to do. I'm calling it Operation Retribution. Oh? Am I in it? My word you are. Lend me that pink ear. Mm -hmm. Tonight, you wear the pants. Whose? Yours. In fact, you get yourself up in that immaculate dress suit I had made for you, complete with top hat, ebony cane, and opera cloak. Where are we going? To Lady Bradbury's reception. I have an invitation. I'm due there at 10 p.m. in an hour's time. I propose to, um, collect during the evening. But we can't both go. You're not twins. Why do you think I grew a moustache and had an exact replica made for you and had that most expensive wig made for you? I'm still in the dark. <laughs> yes, that's part of the plot. Barbara, in your dress suit, gents for the use of, plus moustache and wig, you look very much like me, provided you don't get into a blaze of light. In fact, you'll be my alibi. What a lucky thing it is that you're a tall girl and I'm not a tall man. Dash off now and change. Hop it through the hole in the wall. Meet me at the corner. I'll pick you up in the Daimler. Half an hour's all we've got. I'll explain in the car. Now, put me out of my misery, Rowley. Hey, you'll put us both out if you shoot the red lights like that. Uh, by the way, as you are supposed to be driving, put on this chauffeur's cap and button the cape across your shirt front. Uh-huh. Good. Now, here are the details of Operation Retribution. Sir Tom Bradbury was, um, one of your objectives. Yes. My father, you know. He was... All right. All right. Don't let's get involved. At any rate, we are going to have a slap at the old buzzard tonight. Good. How? Lady B and he are having this duel. I'm invited and I'm taking the opportunity, as I told you, of, um, collecting. 
There'll be about 200 guests. Dan, tiaras, furs, You're not going to do a hold-up, surely, and pack the Daimler with loot? <laughs> Certainly not. But there's a dinky little wall safe in the main bedroom I'm interested in. Now, listen carefully. You pass the Bradbury house and park a hundred yards down the street. Mm -hmm. I get out and walk back into the house and join the party. At the opportune moment, I stroll upstairs and... Uh, voila! And... And what do I do? You wait in the car for exactly 15 minutes. Then you park the chauffeur's cap, doff the cape, and stroll back towards the house. Get onto the porch, keeping clear of lights. Take a cigarette out, and look as if you'd just come out from within for a breather. And for heaven's sake, keep in the shadows. Meanwhile... Meanwhile, I'm upstairs doing a little job on the Bradbury safe. Actually, quite a number of people will have seen me having that cigarette you are smoking on the porch. Then, should I be delayed or have to make a dramatic, not to say hurried exit via the servant's stairs... You are more or less a conspicuous alibi as to my whereabouts. You're very clever, darling, aren't you? <laughs> I truly am. And sometime or other, remind me to kiss you for your kind remarks. Uh, uh, one thing. Remember, there's bags and bags of jeweled and bedizened old frumps in there. And the cops will be there too in their legions. So, watch out. And then what? That is the question. Should a hubbub arise, loud lamentations or such, quietly disappeared in the direction of the Daimler. Drive like mad, go home, put yourself to bed, etc. But what about you, Roly? If luck is with me, I shall walk home, like a victor laden with the spoils. If not, I shall drive, but not in a Daimler. Rather, in one of those dark and truck-like things beloved of the police. And it will not be going home, it will be heading in the sign of the blue lamp. Now stand by. It's zero hour. Listen again for the further development of this story of the mysterious Roland Fletcher, The Grey Goose. The Grey Goose, Adventures of a Modern Robin Hood. Barbara's father, Brian Favisham, was still in jail, suffering for the sins of his business associates. Barbara and I dubbed them the 40 Thieves. One of them was a wealthy city man, Sir Thomas Bradbury. So, having an invitation... I decided to put in an appearance at Sir Thomas's home. Lovely party, Lady Bradbury. I'm so glad you're enjoying yourself, Mr. Fletcher. Mr. Fletcher? Well, Roland. Ah. My dear man, how do you manage to keep so smart and young and uh, 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 youthful? <laughs> dear, you make me feel so old. Lady Bradbury, I really must introduce you to my beauty specialist. She must be charming. Uh, not a bit. She's a he, and he's an ex-pugilist and trader. <laughs> Always wanted to have your little joke, weren't you? Yes, uh, failing of mine, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, do go on enjoying yourself, Roland. You'll excuse me, I'm sure. Yes. I, I must see to my guest. Quarter past. Must get a move on. Gosh, what a crowd. Never noticed me going upstairs. I hope. Ah, uh -uh. friend Ben Ford in the offing. Where are you going, sir? Oh, just upstairs. I expect they've got one up there. There's one down here, just down that passage. Good heavens, Roly Fletcher. Well, 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 if it isn't the university sleuth. Ben Ford, how are you? Didn't know you knew our fat ladyship, Bradbury. No, tonight's my first experience of the lady. As a fact, I'm here on business. Business? But there's a party on. Oh, I see. Hence the fish and chips. That is the business. You see, Roly, there's quite a lot of wealth in what have you here tonight. But uh, what's that got to do with you? Well, there's a very particular, not to say spectacular, cracksman at work lately. Very clever devil, too. You don't say. I do mm. say. 
He's got some bug in his hair that he's a modern Robin Hood. That's from his point of view. But it doesn't work today, not these days. The yard takes a very dim view of the whole affair. It was thought he may decide to operate tonight. At Lady Bradbury's at home? Yes, at Lady Bradbury's at home. Huh, terrible. And so you and your sleuths are on the mark, ready to make an immediate arrest. If he tries anything, yes. But I may say I don't think he'll show up tonight. It's too obvious. Oh, you think so? Yes. But if he does, if anybody loses as much as a single hairpin, I'll get him. Oh, that sounds most convincing, Ben. I uh, wish you luck. Sorry to leave you, but I really must go. Down the passage, you said, didn't you, Ben? Ah, <laughs> oh, there you are, Inspector. Do come and talk to me. You can still keep your eyes open, can't you? Madam, it'd be more to our mutual benefit if you forgot I was an inspector. Oh, of course. I mean, Mr. Ford. Nothing suspicious up to date? No, madam, not yet. Well, perhaps I'm too... Too imaginative, but I really am flattered that Scotland Yard is interested. It's so unusual. We're not generally interested, my lady, in petty theft. We're here tonight on account of somewhat greater issues than petty theft. Oh, but of course. How is the Bloodhound Trail? I do hope it leads you somewhere. I I'm terribly worried for my guest's property. Oh, uh, uh, weren't you talking just now to that charming Mr. Roland Fletcher? Why, yes, he was here a minute ago. I wonder where... Oh, there he is. Apparently gone out onto the porch for smoke. Yes, that's him. I'd never mistake that wonderful poise he seems to have. So handsome, too. Uh, should he come in, do send him to find me. I've got a really charming girl. He must be. I certainly will. Roland Fletcher's a very lucky man. With Ben Ford in the main hall, I think I'll make for the back stair. Mm. This is the room. Ye gods. A glimmer of light under the door. Let's put on my mask, it seems. Somebody at the safe, obviously. Police, police. Oh, dearie me, where are you? Well, here it goes. Stick him up, pal. Hey, hey, uh, uh, blimey, you're tough. You're straight, Governor. I, I ain't done nothing. Oh, I... no. Stand up and shut up huh? and chuck that torch over here. All right. Now, let's get a good look at you. Well, I'm jiggered. The famous, or infamous rather, Sam Burnett. Look here, Governor. I don't know who you are, but... Don't squeal on me and I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll split with you. 50-50. Split with me, you rat. What do you think I am? I'll tell you. I reckon you can't be on the level or you wouldn't be wearing that there black thing across your fez. And in any case, how do you know who I am? Sammy boy, your face is familiar and as ugly as the GPO. You've been in for burglary a dozen times. Robbery with violence, and twice you've done a stretch for beating up that rather nice wife of yours. Oh, look here, Mr. Nowell. Put that there gun down and I'll take it out on you like the missus never knowed about, see? No thanks, rat. I've got other plans for you and for myself. Just pick up some of those diamond trinkets. Uh, what, you, you mean... Yes, I mean, put them in your pocket. Blimey. Now, chuck those notes and those papers over here. Quick, you lump of gutter scrapings. Thanks. You know, Sam, I'm a bit grateful to you. That saves an awkward one. I didn't expect to find you here, and uh, I didn't expect to find the safe uh, well and truly opened. So you're... So I'm nothing. You've saved me quite a deal of trouble. But notwithstanding that, Sam, I'm not feeling friendly towards you. I hate bullies and cards and wife beaters. As a matter of fact, we are well met. I didn't expect to pay off two scores, one on you and the other our host. So now, Sam, much obliged as I am for the safe opening, here's one for the wife. And one, two, three, and a four. I'll do it. 
What a coincidence, Samuel. You'll lie just by an open safe. Your pockets are filled with the odds and ends of old Bradbury's odds and ends. My, my, what a catch for the gendarme. Well, just to puzzle them when they arrive, there's a little token, a grey feather from the grey goose. Where would you like it? In the air, I think. So, now, my poor unconscious Sam, I'm going to make the welkin ring. In fact, I'm going to blow a police whistle. And in one moment, hordes will be upon you, and you'll be jugged for at least two years. My hat. Won't Mrs. Sam miss you? Give her my love when you come out. Well, cheerio, Sam. Oh, my gun. You can have it. It's only a sort of new design for a cigarette lighter. Now, here goes. And now me for the back stairs and out into the night. Home only and don't spare the patent leather shoes. Bristow, Marx, keep those stairs clear. Come with me, careful. Yes, sir. So what's on up here? Well, I'm jiggered. Careful, put the cuffs on that man. Yes, sir. And quiet, everybody. Why, he's out, sir. Right out to it. Good heavens, sir, it's Sam. Sam, Sam who? Sam Burnett. One of the oldest lags in the game, sir. Oh, I know that, confound it. I can see something else. Yes, sir. A grey feather in his ear hole. Yes, a grey feather. Careful. Yes, Inspector. More in this than meets the eye. How, sir? There's the safe open, and here's Sam Burnett loaded with the diamonds and things. Damn it, Constable, Sam's out cold. Maybe his pockets are loaded with the stuff from the safe. But he didn't knock himself out. Nor did he give himself such a beating up. Nor did he, for that matter, present himself with that grey feather or blow a police whistle. All right, everyone. Please return to the party downstairs. <laughs> This is the work of the Grey Goose. And Sam Burnett, isn't he? That's one thing certain. Well, that's another one up to the Grey Goose. Nice night, sir. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Leaving now, sir? Yes. Seeing as you've been out here most of the time, you must have missed the Barney inside, I suppose. Yes. Uh, <coughs> got a cold. Good night. Good night, Sam. Well, I'm darned. I reckon Mr. Rowland Fletcher's at it. He ain't very talkative tonight. I was a gone coon, Rowley, when that door porter talked to me. All I could say was, <coughs> yes. <laughs> a very cooperative monosyllable, Barbara, in some cases. Rowley, behave, please. <laughs> now, tell me the rest. Well, quite unexpectedly, that toad Sam Burnett will get a load of what he mostly deserves. Mrs. Burnett will be relieved of his company for at least two years. Oh, that reminds me. Shove a hundred-pound notes into an envelope and post them to her. Oh, she'll just love that. <laughs> no. Now, strange enough, darling, Mrs. Burnett is one of those women who would rather have two black eyes and her husband around than even a thousand pounds. <laughs> women are like that. <gasps> Rowley! Would you like a poke at my eyes? <laughs> Not for the moment, darling. We've got other things to do. There's the Bradbury Papers. Oh, I'd forgotten. I hadn't. From that safe that Sam so conveniently opened, I procured a very substantial amount of bearer bonds. Release them on the market tomorrow, and the Bradbury millions will melt away to nothing. Good. And then? There's enough other company notes of bad flotations, etc., to get him ten years. And my father? Not yet, my dear. But I think you can safely cross out another name from your list. The name of Bradbury. Another name. Another name nearer father's release. Yes, my dear. And a step nearer.
Listen again for the next adventure of Roland Fletcher, freebooter, modern Robin Hood, the man they call the Grey Goose. The Grey Goose, Adventures of a Modern Robin Hood. My alliance with Barbara Faversham seems to be paying dividends. We've practically eliminated Sir Thomas Bradbury. At any rate, he's ruined. And deservedly so, in that he was instrumental in getting Barbara's father a jail sentence. <laughs> By the way, that convenient arrangement between Barbara's flat and my own, namely a hinged bookcase, makes quick exits and communication easy. Huh. Now, this particular morning we have a call to make in Farrington Market, just off Hoban Viaduct. A remarkable place, this. You can buy anything from candlesticks to lawnmowers, even handcuffs. Handc... Oh, perish the thought. Wonderful place, Rowley. True. And every hundred yards of Farrington Market has its quota of thieves, pickpockets, and tricksters. But never mind the market anymore. We turn down the street. Now, hey, hey, what's all the hubbub? There's a man running towards us. Oh, Rowley, look. He's got an old clock in his arms. By Jove, he has. Stop, thief. Stop He's stolen thief. it. Listen. By all means, stop him. Get out of my way. Not so, my friend. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Brought him down like a bird. Now, what's it all about? Oh, oh thank you indeed, sir. I uh, valued that clock. It's an old Dutch timepiece. Uh, uh, possibly the only asset I have of any value. So it's yours, eh? But how did that bird get hold of it? <laughs> indeed, sir, yes, it is mine. And how he got hold of it is fairly obvious, if you'll do me the honour of walking 20 or 30 yards. Well done, sir. You brought him down like a trimmer. I reckon I'll take charge of him now. Good. Thanks, Constable. But what is all that to do? Well, sir, you'll know all about it if you'll follow the old gentleman, as he said. His name's Crewe. Raphael Crew, an odd luck case if ever there was one. There, sir, there is the beginning of the trouble. But what is all this? These bits of furniture on the pavement. Eviction, miss. Old man Crew's been turned out. I was ordered to stand by as protection. But that son of Satan, Slimy Joe, got behind me and half inched the clock and scarp it. Well, under the circumstances, I am very glad I connected. Slimy Joe ain't so pleased, though. Still dazed. Oh, I reckon that was a rare one you give him. The constable has told you, sir, of my predicament. Uh, a matter of rent, you understand. It has been an unfortunate time for my wife and myself. The old lady's in hospital, sir. Do something, Rowley. He's a dear old man. We'll see. He's as honest as the day, sir. A real gent, as the saying is, but struck some bad luck, and what with the old lady's illness beside, he's flat broke. So you see the result? Everything he's got's out in the pavement. Don't fumble, Rowley. Do something. All right, my dear, but don't be impatient. Uh, Mr. Crewe, how much do you owe? That, sir, is entirely my business. You have already obliged me in the matter of the clock, and I am grateful. Shall we leave it at that? But we wish to help. Look, all your belongings on the pavement. What's to happen to them? That again, miss, is my business. I, though seemingly struggling in a rough sea, will keep myself afloat, as it were. There are always kind friends. Why who... shouldn't I be one of them? I, I really would like to help. Uh, just alone, if you like. Would uh, 20 pounds help? It's all I've got in my purse. Madam, it would more than help. It would completely extricate me from the very embarrassing situation in which I find myself... Indeed, I thank you. Well, there we are. Well, darling, having distributed largesse and so forth, are you ready to come along? Certainly. Goodbye, Mr. Crewe. Goodbye, miss, and may God reward you for your kindness to an old unfortunate. Well, now, to the business in hand. Little Charlie Austin lives around here. Austin? Austin, and he doesn't make cars. 
By heavens, I'm almost advertising. Barbara, promise me one thing, one very serious thing. But what can it be? Never, never advertise. Now, here's Charlie's little shop. Enter, madame. And what can I do for you? Oh, blimey, if it ain't... No names, Charlie? No pack drill. Are they ready? The necklace is all correct, sir. As beautiful a set of uh, diamonds as ever you did see. Diamonds? A figure of speech, Barbara. Charlie is an expert. What you see are worth more than diamonds, rubies and pearls. They are the oyster openers to the treasure houses of the world. Commonly called by novelists, crime reporters and other romancers, skeleton keys. There ain't a better set in the kingdom, so help me. True. Thank you, Charlie. And here's the money. Thank you, Mr... Hex. Eh? Hex is good, Charlie. <laughs> See you later. Come, Barbara. Now for home. Wait. Dodge into this doorway with me, quickly. But... Quiet. Do you see what I see? What do you see? I see my old friend Ebenezer Ford, Chief Inspector Ford, standing across the road. Why shouldn't he? More to the point, why should he? He's watching Charlie's place. Do you think he saw us come out? Afraid he did. Don't talk, just watch. Yes, as he's going to Charlie's place. I don't underestimate friend Ford a wee bit. Come along, Farrington Market is no place for you and me. It's home and quickly. Why, if it ain't the inspector himself. Morning, Charlie. Behaving yourself? Why, Inspector Ford. All right, all right. As long as you're on the side of law and order, we won't drag up old sores. How's burglary these days? Mr. Ford. All right, cut the innocence. I know, we all know you're as white as the driven snow when it's been down two weeks. What was that swell doing in your shop just now? Who is he? What is he? What did he want? Oh, you're confusing me, Inspector. Listen, Charlie. You're out of stir for a time. Behave and you'll keep out. You're the best locksmith and key wanger outside of Dartmoor. Your customers aren't bank managers and safe deposit curators. Now, what did you sell that customer? Quick! Just a bunch of... Uh, he, uh... He what? He had trouble with his safe at home. Trouble? Uh, lost the key, he said. So you supplied him with a bunch good enough to open the Bank of England. I didn't mean no harm, Inspector. He's a respectable gent, he is. Oh, he is, eh? Mm, I, uh, I don't know his name. Well, don't you worry. I do. All right, Charlie. Mind you keep your nose a bit cleaner before I pay you another visit. There's still room in Dartmoor for accomplices and fences. I'll see you later. Do you think we got away before that inspector saw us? No, I don't think so. At the same time, he couldn't pin anything on us, provided Charlie Austin did his bit. But isn't Ford the inspector, the one who pieced the bits together and formulated his Grey Goose Robin Hood theory? That's the man. My old schoolmate at Eton, now turned policeman. Do give up this grey feather conceit of yours. <laughs> Not in your life. I'm just looking forward to presenting him with one. Hello? The warning buzzer. Someone coming along the passage. Press the bottom of the bookcase, Barbara, and the moves. You mustn't be found in my flat. Right. I'm off. Coming! Hello, Rowley. Well, if it isn't my Etonian sleuth, come in, Ben. Thank you. Drink? Cigarette? No, no, neither thanks. I'm on duty. Duty? Come, come. What have I done to exercise your duty consciousness? Nothing that I can pinpoint, Fletcher. But didn't I see you in Farrington Street Market today? Oh, yes, I was in the market. And if you were there, you probably saw me, but I didn't notice you. What were you selling? What were you buying, Fletcher? I? Uh... Some keys at Charlie Austin. Oh, uh, keys. Why, well, yes, Charlie Austin. Oh, is that a chap? You see, Ben, I'm actually Fletcher of the Fletcher Lock and Safe Co. Ever heard of me? Oh, why, of course. Well, though I could edit the firm, I've invented quite a number of our specials. I'm always experimenting, and so I use all the burglar's stock in trade. Charlie Austin is one of the most expert cracksmen in the city. Really? A pal told me he was the chap to help me. Hmm. Were your keys any good? My word, yes. For the first time in months, I managed to open my own safe without a key. Gave me a whole kit of keys, too. Skeletons, I suppose. Is that what you all are? Yes, that's what I and the police and the crooks call them. Good. I'll call them ditto. Fletcher, just let's stop fencing, shall we? Fencing, Ben? Yes, fencing. What do you require a set of skeleton keys for? Why, I've told you, Ben. And that's honest. And... 
<laughs> you wouldn't experiment on any other lock, would you? Oh, really, Ben, aren't you being a bit absurd? All right, forget it. But you can't stop me wondering a bit. Wondering? Oh, for heaven's sake. Look, let's have a drink. <laughs> yes, very well, I will. Whiskey and soda, if you please. Cigarette? No, 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 I'll smoke my pipe, thanks. You know, Fletcher, I, I was rather interested in your other activities in the market today. Oh? Yes, you, you were taken for a real ride. Was I? Old man Crewe, Raphael. The victim of the ejection order? The same. <laughs> well, how was I taken for a ride? Oh, very old confidence trick. You gave him 20 pounds, didn't you? Well, my lady friend did. <laughs> the furniture on the pavement, the dignity of the old man. Go on. Even the policeman, phony right throughout. My hat, you don't say... Oh, dear. Got a pipe cleaner. My pipe stuck up, I think. So that dear old man Crewe was a confidence trickster. <laughs> yes, Fletcher. Does the same trick every week. You got that pipe cleaner? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. I'm sorry. Here you are. A feather. I would. How I laugh when I saw you so beautifully taken in. <laughs> oh, well, that's better. <coughs> Pipe's going now. Oh, well, that refers to me. I must be off too. Well, thanks for the call, Ben. Cheerio. <laughs> See you in jail. Here's your hat. There What's you your hurry, as they say today? <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Fletcher. Good night, Ben. <laughs> I'll still be laughing at your takedown at Paddington Market. <laughs> Cheerio. <laughs> is that my hat? There it is. Damn me, I didn't have a feather in it. Found it. It's a grey feather. A grey goose feather. Listen again to the adventures of Roland Fletcher, alias the Grey Goose. The story. The Grey Goose, Adventures of a Modern Robin Hood. I was a little worried as to why my old friend Inspector Ford paid me a call. What was he doing in Farrington Market? However, I explained the purpose of the skeleton keys and I think he went away satisfied. Or did he? <laughs> I did manage a somewhat reckless gesture by placing one of my grey goose feathers in his hat band when he wasn't looking. And so he departed. Decorated. <laughs> well, I'm... How did that get there? A grey goose feather in my hat? Fletcher! Fletcher, open up! Hurry, hurry, open up! Is that you, Ben? Yes, it is. Open up! By Jove, it is you. But you've only been gone a minute. I know, I know. Let, let me in and I'll explain. Of course, come in by all means. My hat, have you seen a ghost? No, I have not. Well, you look like it. Drink? Yes, I will have a drink. No, oh, confound it. No, 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 I haven't time. Look, Ben, why this sudden return? You've only just got to the other side of my door and within a minute you're clamouring to come in again. You can't be that thirsty. Or are you? Oh, for heaven's sake, Fletcher, stop bragging. Look, 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 look at my hat. Jolly nice for a policeman. Cost anything from three guineas up, maybe. Damn it, man, look at the feather in the band. I'm looking, Ben. Tree chic, if I may say so, sort of Tyrolean effect. Do you yodel in your spare oh, time? Oh, shut up! I do not yodel, nor am I a Tyrolean. What's it? Now, now, listen, Fletcher. I do not wear feathers in my hat band. But you're wearing one now. I know I am, I know I am, but I didn't put it there. Mind you, I think it suits you. Oh, for heaven's sake, shut up! This is a grey goose feather. Sort of exclusive to your famous grey goose, eh? I, I, I don't mean that at all. Now, you must know I'm on the trail of a fellow I've christened the grey goose. He's a sort of Robin Hood type, leaves a grey goose feather wherever he's been. He's got us all sunk. He's a robber, a thief, worse. And, and what happens? Well, what? I, I, mark you, I get a grey goose feather in my hat. When? When, 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 I don't know when. 
I don't know when the darn feather was put in my hat. Can't you cast your mind back at all? Where have you been all day? Oh, don't be so idiotic. I've paid 20 calls, probably. And I suppose you politely took your hat off each time? Don't be sarcastic. Even policemen have manners. Well, how can I help you? I don't know, I don't know. But you did give me a feather cleaner for my pipe, didn't you? True. And there's a little gadget full of them. Uh, on the mantelpiece. Hmm? Hmm? Oh. Oh. Cock's feathers. Uh, green, brown... Oh, grey ones. Uh, tell me more of this grey goose bloke. Well, well, you've read your papers, I suppose. Yes. You christened him the grey goose, and repute had it that he was a modern kind of Robin Hood, robbed on the side and made generous donations to the underdogs, right? Yes, that's roughly right, and I, I'm the poor red detail to run him to earth. Oh, tough proposition, all right. Uh, ben, shall I bore you with a little bedtime story? Yes, yes, go on, go on, bore me. It'll be a change for me. Well, it's not long. But Robin Hood, as you know, defied the laws as laid down by Prince John. A dirty dog, if ever there was one. So the prince put it to the sheriff of Nottingham, another very dirty dog, even a little dirtier, to go out and find Robin. Do you follow me? Well, of course I do. You're inferring that I'm the sheriff of Nottingham. Oh, just an analogy. But let me finish the story. Robin's men beat back the sheriff, chucked him in a pond, and in the long run, the sheriff of Nottingham came to a sticky end. That's the end of the story, too. Well, let me tell you this. I am not the Sheriff of Nottingham, and I am not anticipating a sticky end. And soon I'll lay this Robin Hood, Grey Goose, or what have you, by the heels. Well, apparently you can't help, so I'll be on my way once more. But woe betide the next clever fellow that sticks a feather in my hat. Believe me, I feel you really mean that, Ben. Uh, another drink? No, 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 thanks. Cheer, Fletcher, and good night. Uh, what of the feather... Are you going to continue wearing it? I... No down fear. Here, you take it. Thanks. I might find it useful. As? Oh, just as uh, another pipe cleaner. Oh. Cheerio, Ben. <whistles> yes, Barbara, you can come in. Push the bookcase button. Well, well. You heard? Yes, every word. Huh. I switched on your mic and my speaker. Roly, why will you dilly-dally and play with fire? Inspector Ford's no fool. He's bound to put feathers and facts together someday. And you'll be for the high jump. I've told you, Barbara, I have my conceits. Do you know, it was almost more than I could do to restrain myself from putting another feather in his hat. That would have been <laughs> complete idiocy. True, but what a laugh. What a denouement. I'm certain, however, I'd have escaped the consequences. How? Inspector Ebenezer Ford would have had a seizure on the spot and would have thereafter remained dumb. Well, I'm glad you restrained yourself. <laughs> and now, what next? This, my Barbara. Today, you and I took compassion on an old man, Mr. Crewe, Mr. Raphael Crewe. Yes, I parted with 20 pounds to an old confidence man. <laughs> Don't worry, I heard everything over the speaker. Good. Vendetta and all that. Do we stand for having wool pulled over our ears by that same old gentleman? Echo answers, no. Listen now, my sweet. We investigate friend Raphael Crewe, and although he's not one of our main and mutual objectives, we get our own back somehow. Yes, but how? He swindled me for 20 pounds. True. Well, we must get that back, and also put Mr. Raphael Crewe back in his place. So the hour being what it is, we pay another call to that little street just off Farrington Market. <laughs> By Jove, Charlie Austin's keys are good. We're in. In Mr. Raphael Crewe's little menage. Shh, and tread softly. Now for a little light. Switch on your torch. Mm -hmm. Well, do you see what I see? I do. Every stick of furniture that we saw evicted and on the pavement back in place. <laughs> we certainly were taken for a ride. Come on. We'll explore the upper regions. Oh, dear, that creek. Are you sure there's no one in? Definitely. I phoned Charlie Austin, and he said he saw the old gentleman leave an hour ago. He may return. True. Thus, my dear, we must be good. And watch and pray. Pray that he doesn't. Here's another door. By the gods of the underworld, open too. Or oh, torch. 
Well, well, well. A luxury suite if ever there was one. Magnificent. There's something very screwy here. That old living room come shop downstairs is only a blind. Old crew must be a cover-up man for the occupant of all this luxury. Pull those heavy drapes over the window. There's a good girl. While I shut the door. Mm-hmm. Now we can switch on a light. It's certainly a lovely place. I hope old Raphael Crew doesn't keep a blonde up here. <laughs> <laughs> Not unless she smokes a pipe. Look at that rack there. Oh. No, as I said before, there's something screwy here. Let's have a quick look-see. You tackle that desk, I'll go for the chest. Right. Better look for letters first, don't you think? Yes. Oh, just one thing. See if there's a back room, bathroom, window or something out back. We might have to use it. Always make sure of our alternative exit. Hmm. Nothing here. Shirts. Socks. Hmm. Some taste. A1 quality, too. What's this? Letters. Dear Tracy. Tracy. Doesn't sound much like Raphael. Tracy, who, I wonder? I've been all over. There's a bathroom off the passage and a little kitchen. Both have windows overlooking a back lane too high up to jump through. Oh, that's not so good, is it? Listen. What's that? Douse the lights, quick. I look between the curtains. It's all right. It's a lorry stopping right opposite. Don't right worry about it. Put the light on? Yes. Good. Now, get on with the search. Letters. Two of them. Dear Tracy. Tracy what, I wonder? Or what, Tracy? That may be his surname. Uh, doesn't ring a bell with me. My hat, what was that? Did you touch anything? I put my hand on the knob of this bottom drawer. Do it again, but don't keep it up. Just quickly. That's it. Barbara, we're getting warm. That drawer contains something, and if touched, rings an alarm in the downstairs premises. Maybe it also rings somewhere else. In that case, we must hurry. Can you open the drawer? No. It appears to be locked. Let me have a go at it. Uh, don't touch the knob. Now, ah, let's see. I'll have to see how little Charlie Austin's keys work again. Rolly, if... If that buzzer has registered somewhere else, don't you think we should get out? I certainly do. But not before we find out what all this is about. Ah, I think I got the door open at last. Good old Charlie Austin. Well, I jiggered. Only clothes. Only clothes. My dear idiot, haven't you heard that clothes make the man? Of course, but... These clothes uh, make it the man, Raphael Crewe. Look, every stitch. Old shabby coat, frayed grey trousers, little soiled dicky. The whole outfit, as worn this very morning by the dear, dear old gent that did you down for twenty smackers. My girl, the pot begins to boil. What's got into you now? Uh, this Raphael Crewe is Tracy someone and or someone Tracy is Raphael Crewe and so on. And look, look in this pocket. Great Scott, old-fashioned glasses. And white wig, moustache and beard. Mm. Just imagine. Yes, and just imagine Mr. Tracy Query wearing them. And we have old man Raphael Crewe. Indeed, and indeed, yes. Barbara Watson, you're a marvellous partner to me, Sherlock Fletcher. Listen, someone on that stair. Douse the light while I get that heavy tablecloth. We mustn't be seen. I'm going to throw it over the head of anyone who comes in. Jump at him with me. Stand still, whoever you are. I have a gun and also this torch. Don't move. Let me have a look at you. Quick. Be sure to listen again to the culmination of this adventure of Roland Fletcher, the modern Robin Hood, known as the Grey Goose. I have 
been here. The Grey Goose. Adventures of a Modern Robin Hood. This is your Grey Goose speaking. Oh, good heavens, Roland Fletcher, you are talking like a radio announcer. Well, to continue, I must say we were very annoyed at Inspector Ford's story of how old man crew hoaxed us in that eviction episode. And as you know, we paid the place a visit and discovered old man crew wasn't old man crew. Just as we'd come to this conclusion, the door opened and we hurled ourselves at the intruder, enveloping him in the velvet tablecloth. What the devil? Who are you? Hold on, my dear. Cling like a oh, little bit. You, you. Uh, I'll soon get this gentleman tied up. <coughs> ah. Good. Even a Michaelmas goose, grey or otherwise, couldn't be better trussed up. Oh, take the darn thing off my head. I'm, I'm suffocating. <laughs> Not a chance, my dear fellow. We, that is my companion and myself, are not wearing masks. And strangely enough, Conscious as we may be of our prepossessing features, we prefer to remain anonymous, incog as it were. Your head, draped as it is, does not permit you to see us. However, I think we ought to allow you a little breathing space, so we'll cut a little hole near the mouth. Oh, cut the cackle and come down to the brass tacks. Oh, you're just a couple of burglars, am I right? No, sir, you're wrong. We are evildoers doing no evil. <laughs> funny, that. I don't think it's funny at all. You've made a burglarious entry into my flat. Your flat? Ah. Then we are addressing Mr. Raphael Crewe. Or are we talking to Mr. Tracy something? Or Mr. Something Tracy? Come on. Don't be coy. I'll say nothing. My fair partner in crime and myself hate obstinacy. Don't we, dear? That's right, Carl. Ooh, not the best, my dear. Try another of your 20 radio voices. You said a mouthful, Pod. <laughs> Excellent. Now, Mr. Sanso, would you recognize that voice again? Shut up. What do you want? Your cue, my dear. You tell him in, um, in, uh, voice two, I think. Good. We want to know, cute boy, who you are. We reckon you is both our crew esquire or somebody Tracy. Come on, fellas, spill it. I won't answer that. Pod, have you got that cigarette lighter? I reckon I'll try the flame treatment on his fingernails and make him sing. Go ahead, partner. Here's my lighter. Good. Now, Tracy, you can't move this hand. Give me a thumb or open up. Don't, for the love of heaven. Listen, what have you two against me? A truth to tell, very little yet. Except that you play an exceedingly fine role as an old man. Raphael Crewe, a man who's been evicted from his premises. His furniture strewn across the street, waiting for a charitably minded dupe. How do you know that? Ha <laughs> ha. We are not without friends. Now, out with it. You run the poor old shop downstairs, but you also run this very lovely flat upstairs. My dear, the cigarette lighter... Right ho, boss. No, no, not that. All right. I'm Tracy Baldwin, and I do run a small shop downstairs, antiques and such. Under the name of Raphael Crewe? Yes. No harm in that, I suppose. Oh, not at all. Even I have uh, a trade name. All right, then. What's all this caper in aid of? Just this. We, my partner and I are now most interested in the beard and makeup of Mr. Raphael Crewe, but more in the activities of Mr. Tracy Baldwin. There's a nasty smell somewhere, Tracy. Come on, where is it? I don't know what you mean. My dear, the cigarette lighter. Here you are, Governor. Thanks. You dirty... Shut up. Partner, just see if our friend has a bunch of keys in his pocket. I'm a bit interested in that excellent safe of his. Oh, curse you. Take your hands off me, you... you... Stop uh... Tracy, I have only one regret, that you can't see the very charming face of the lady who is delving in your pockets. Got them? Yes, boss. Now, the safe. It's a pretty big one for a private flat. What do you keep in it, Tracy? The crown jewels? Pull the drawers out, dear, and bring them over here. Jumping horses. Look at here, boss. Crown jewels, you said. Well, well, well. Tracy, my dear, do you wear tiaras and diamond bracelets when you go social? Oh, shut up and be damned to you. This looks very much like the Malmesbury sapphires. And these, holy smoke, are none other than Sortar's exhibition. Oh, for heaven's sake, Mr. Tracy. 
Any cash there, partner? A ton of it, boss. What'll I do with it? Do with it? What a question. Do what Omar Khayyam said. Take the cash in hand and um, leave the rest. Good. Now, Tracy, you don't appear to be big enough in heart to be a burglar, so I can only come to one conclusion. You're one of those offences to society. Offence. <laughs> Rather good. Offence is offence. Oh, terrible, I know. But it amuses me. Ha, uh, ha. Uh, very good. Amuses me, too. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not amused, and if ever I get a chance to get even with you, clever dick, you just look out. I will. And there's something you don't know, smart guy. Did you, when snooping around, manage to hear a buzzer go? I did. So did I. That activates a similar noise in my other place. Oh, yes? And where's that? Oh, that's telling, isn't it? In any case, how do you suppose I got here when I did? The buzzer? Yes, the buzzer again. And when I hear that clever dick, I immediately contact a near police station. Oh, yes, and then what? Then they get a move on and come straight here. And then? You are nabbed. Oh, how very uncomfortable. Now, listen to me, Happy Joe. Suppose they do come. They see a safe open and jewels in it of which every policeman has a description. Who the devil do you think you are, anyway? You'll be nabbed for certain. <laughs> no, my friend. Definitely no. We have an alternative. You have... I see you have a telephone. Come. Let me help you up. Oops. Uh, ah, <laughs> that's it. Now, ring your police station and tell them it's a mistake. Remember my cigarette lighter? Eh? Come on, I'll dial. Police, Clarkenwell Station. Go on, I'm listening. That you, Sergeant? Yeah. Tracy Baldwin here. Oh, yes, sir. Got your call. Just detailing two constables. Tell him it's a false alarm. It... Uh, sorry, it was a false alarm. Oh, everything all right then, sir? Uh, yes, everything. Thanks for tipping us off. Good night, sir. Uh, good night. Well done, Tracy Old Scout. Now we can rest easy, can't we? No, you damned idiot. That sergeant has strict instructions not to accept a message from me unless I preface it with a code word, known only to them and me. And that means... You know as well as I do. You and your beautiful partner will be copped any minute from now. Look out of the window, my dear. Careful. Any signs of life? Yes. Two police coming towards this house. Right. It's the back way out for us. The bathroom window. But... No buts. Well, my friend, it seems we have to leave you somewhat hurriedly. So long. No time to lose, Barbara. Here, under my vest. Piano wire. Piano wire? Here, help me unwind it. <laughs> so, now, link the swivel round your waist. Mm -hmm. It'll bear a ton or so. Don't worry. Right. Secure? Yes, then out of the bathroom window with you, I'll lower you down by turning round and round. When you touch ground, release the swivel. But you, how will you get down? Don't worry, leave that to me. Now then, off you go. Ah. Mm. Ah. Ah. Okay. Yes, safe. Now me, just loop this end over the tap. Stand aside, Barbara. Here I come. Let's run. Come on. And leave my escape line. No fear. Watch this. Now, help me wind it round my waist again. My own patent. <laughs> Marvellous, don't you think? That's it. Now home as fast as Shank's pony can take us. Now, Roly, tell me something. How, after sliding down that wire, you didn't cut your hands to pieces? <laughs> Here's the secret. Old gardening gloves, well resined. But how did you get the wire back off the tap? Oh, that. There's a fine fishing line also attached near where I secured the wire to the tap. In addition, there's a neat little cutting gadget. On arrival on earth, as it were, I jerk the fishing line, that works the cutter, and down comes the lot. I lose only the little twist round the tap. Marvellous invention. The brainwave of the best cat burglar in London. Oh, and who's he? Just me, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Look across the road. Yes. Hmm. I seem to recollect that face. It's the man who stole the old Dutch clock when old Raphael Cruz staged his eviction act. Barbara, we have a tale. Yes. He'll follow and find out where you live. I don't think so. Wait here. Uh, friend, I require a light for my cigarette. Why, certainly, Governor, I get it. 
A light? <laughs> All is dark just now, is it not so, my friend? You've killed him? Not a bit of it. I've just made it impossible for him to attempt to follow me any longer for the present. Ah, telephone back. Telephone box. Wait a minute, Barbara. Hello? Hello? Oh, Scotland Yard? Oh, splendid. Get Inspector Ford. Ebenezer Ford, please. Urgent. Hello? That you, Inspector? Who is it? <laughs> Robin Hood. Uh, Grey Goose, Inspector. Why, why, what the devil are you... Ah, ah, ah. Do mind that blood pressure, old chap. Now shut up and tell me what you want. I merely wish to acquaint you with the fact that at number 22 Alcott Street, just off Farrington Market, you will find an antique shop. An antique shop? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in, in antiques. <laughs> You'll just love this one. Your old confidence man, Raphael Crewe. Nor am I interested in Raphael Crewe. Oh, hold it, hold it, old man. Raphael Crewe is none other than Mr. Tracy Baldwin. Ha! You're crazy! No, no. Not crazy. Tracy. He's the biggest fence in England. He's upstairs, bound and blindfolded, or he was, with two cops from Clerkenwell arguing the point. Oh, you'll find one of my visiting cards there. A grey goose feather. <laughs> <laughs> Listen again to the adventures of Roland Fletcher, the story of a modern Robin Hood, the Grey Goose. The Grey Goose, Adventures of a Modern Robin Hood. I can't help admiring Inspector Ford's acumen, and actually I suppose I should applaud him. But being a goose, and a grey goose at that, I feel more like living up to the part and hissing. <laughs> well, we left old Raphael Crewe, alias Tracy Baldwin, to the tender mercy of the inspector. But the man who stole the clock, and the cop who wasn't a cop, they have to be um, eliminated also. <laughs> Barbara, you're a great little actress. That tough baby of yours went over big with Mr. Tracy Baldwin, alias old man Raphael Crewe. <laughs> I never thought I'd remember what you taught me. <laughs> You'll have another chance before long, because the episode Hoodwink is not concluded yet. No. But we've got that old fraud crew, or Baldwin, tied up properly. Tied up is right. <laughs> I'd just like to know his private thoughts when he found himself helpless and wrapped up in his own velvet tablecloth. <laughs> That's another lesson, my dear. Never let our victims get a glimpse of our faces. I'll remember. Well... And now what? I've just said that being hoodwinked is no part of my idea of enjoyment. We've disposed of Chief Hoodwinker, but he had two assistants. Slimy Joel, who stole or appeared to steal the clock, and the cop on the beat who broke our hearts with his story of the eviction of old man Crewe. I heard Inspector Ford tell you they were part of the eviction act. So far, so good. Now Slimy Joel tried tailing us, and I knocked him out. You did? But we can't leave him at that. Neither do I allow phony cops to put one over me. So today I made a few inquiries and I find that Slimy Joe is none other than Joe Bathurst. And who may Mr. Bathurst be otherwise? Just the smart sneak thief or dip. Dip? Pickpocket to you. Now the cop is another matter. He really was a cop once, but was dismissed the force for the good of the force. At any rate, Joe Bathurst and the cop by name Barney Briggs have to be reckoned with. And I propose to do the reckoning. 
Oh, by the way, did you bring away the cash from Baldwin's safe? Yes, 500 pounds in notes. But how very excellent. Now, who shall receive this thing, this very pretty thing? The... the Prisoner's Aid Society. My dear, of course. How right you can be. Send it at once, will you? Yes. Now, for campaign orders for the day, or rather night. When you've had a good rest, dig out your most intriguing frock. Have you such a thing? Why, of course. Good. Then to make it more intriguing, lop a bit off both ends. For heaven's sake. Certainly not. For the sake of Joe and Barney. Targets for tonight, as they say in operational orders. And then? I shall drive you to Tottenham Court Road. Among the shabby nightclubs there is one called the Blue Persian. And what do I do at the Blue Persian? Oh, you stroll in, sit yourself on a high stool at the bar, and buy yourself a double scotch, or a triple brandy, or a quadruple absinthe, if there is such a thing. Then? You commence to languish. Glance covertly round, as it were, looking for, um, a sucker. You're made up, uh, vulgarly, as it were. Your nylons are much in evidence, and incidentally are good. I'm, uh, kind of low. Not exactly. You are kind and low. A vamp. A harpy. And the objective of all this? To be serious, my dear, our cop Barney and slimy Joe Bathurst are generally among those present about the witching hour. There are good for you a few others, but you can brush them off and concentrate on our boys. You'd know them by sight. My word, I would. That's your advantage. They won't recognise that 100 miles per hour Trixie you're going to be. Where will you be? I too shall be there a little later. If you see a smart-looking eye-tie with a rather wide Homburg hat... That will be your humble servant. And where do I meet you? Go out your entrance. I'll drive round that way and pick you up. All right, now. Off you go. Here, I'll press the button for the hole in the wall. Right. Well, it looks as if I'll have to spend the day dressmaking. Cheerio. Cheerio. I wonder whether I'm right in running this kid into these dangers. Still, she's got her father to think of. And maybe, who knows, we can find out the truth in time. For her sake, I'd like to get old Brian Favisham out of jail. He can't be yet. There's a long way to go. Hello? Oh, that you, Skipper? Good man. I knew you'd arrange it. Sending two stalwarts, eh? Hmm? One called Red to say Roly to me. Yeah? And then the fun starts. Good. What time do you up anchor? Hmm? 1 a.m. Splendid. Couldn't be better timed. Suits admirably. What? Huh? <laughs> what do you do with them? Oh, just shove them ashore at Rio. Make sure they're full of rum. <laughs> Good. They'll get pinched as illegal immigrants and spend quite a lot of time in the local jug. <laughs> no, no, no. We'll see they haven't any money. They'll do no bribing in a hurry. Just remember at Rio, you've never seen them. You won't, in any case. <laughs> Thanks, old chap. You're doing the community a service. Fine. Bon voyage. <laughs> There's the blue Persian, Barbara. I'll just drive on and find a parking spot a bit higher up. And you walk back. Suppose I'm, uh, accosted on the way. Oh, just look haughty. I'll not be far behind you in any case. Now, off you go and get those two thugs as jealous and savage as you can in the shortest time. And when I say, where's the music? Sing out, my bag. Somebody's got my handbag. Soda. Of course, dearie. There you are. Stow that stuff. That drink's on me, Toad. Ain't it, Missy? If you say so, fella. Well, thanks. Here's mud in your eye. Same to you. Crikey, you're smart, ain't you? Smart? Better than most of the she males in this place. Wouldn't say that. New here, eh? No, 
Take this dive in now and then. What say you and me dance, eh? We could hold that floor down. I'm not that heavy, oh, big man. Oh, I didn't mean that. Though. Don't take me up. Blimey, I'm popping for you. You're the flashiest type here, I'm telling you. What's your name? Barbara. Barbara what? That's it. Barbara what? How did you know, Sonny? Sonny. Somehow, I like the way you say Sonny. Say it again. Sonny. Actually, me name's Barney, but I like that. Jiminy, you, you are a one. How about another drink? Don't you want to dance? Do I? But we'll just have one for the uh, middle of the floor, eh? Could do with a double scotch. So could I. So fill them up, right? You're a generous sort, uh, ain't you? Nothing generous about standing you a noggin or two. The flash is gold in the room. You said that before. I'll say it again. The flash Don't is gold. Don't worry, I know. And I think you are... Ain't so bad yourself. <laughs> kind of big and strong. What cheer, Barney's son? A friend of yours, Barney? Yes, and we don't want interrupting, see? Well, I ain't interrupting. I just want an intro to the, to flashiest, the flashiest girl, girl in, in the, the room. room. <laughs> Come off that and cut out, will you, Joe? Well, I think the girl would like to know me, see? Now, what'd you say, miss? No harm, Brad. What do you say, Barney? No ill feelings and all that. All right, but I'm off, Joe. This is Barbara Watt. And this here hint of feeling no good is Joe. Uh, gentlemen, I am wonder if it is the possibility you permit me to buy you one a little drink. Good work, Barbara. Now, get out of the way or else I'll... Pardon me, oh, it is just a suggestion. I'm not the butt in again, eh? Yeah, hey, you better not. Just a minute. I move myself a little away. As far as you like, monkey. And talk my button in. Why don't you move up a bit, Joe? You're crowding me and Barbara. Crowded, am I? Yeah, look, Barney, that girl can answer for herself, can't she? Yeah, it's all me what about you, but I'll well, we... You're red? Good. Your pal? Jackson, just be the bar. Say when. In a moment, I shout out, where's the music? Then the girl's head, where's my bag? Yes. There'll be a shindy, and those two you see will get going hammer and tongs. I'll shoot the light out, grab them and go. When you get to the ship, tell the skipper thanks. Right, Rowley. Stand in, boy. You talk of crowding. Ain't you never heard freezer crowd? Crowding? You talking, Joe. What do you know of crowding? Ain't it in your line? The bigger the crowd, the better. So you can do a dip for them. Take that back, slugger. Or do you have a proper? I won't take it back. Sneak thief. Now, what are you going to do? I say here, where is the music? It's not the place for the dancer. Gracious, where's my bag? I had it only a moment ago. Oh, thieves! Robert! What did I say? Joe, give the lady your bag. Barney, I ain't got the bag. I tell you, you have. It's usual with you. Oh, whiz it. Oh. Oh. Right, Red. Go to it. Right. The light. All right, Rowley. Thanks, Red. Where are they? We're just all in a mop. <laughs> See you in port. quiet night is after the fray. I've never seen such a fracas in my life. What has happened to my two swains? <laughs> One o'clock a.m. The tigress bound for Rio de Janeiro is now pulling up anchor. Joe and Barney are occupying berths aboard. What sort of berths? <laughs> Lower berths, my angel. So low, almost to the bilges. But how, Rowley? Skipper Carnegie is an old commando pal of mine. He arranged it. While you arranged the fracas in the blue Persian... They were abducted and put aboard. <laughs> shanghai is the word. Rowley, have we... Have we achieved an advance in... In your dad's case? No, my dear. Nothing this time. But we have achieved the removal of three menaces to society. Mr. Raphael Crewe, alias Tracy Baldwin, Mr. Joe Bathurst, and Mr. Barney Briggs. Thus, Operation Shanghai can be written off as a success. <laughs> Listen again to the adventures of Roland Fletcher, alias the Grey Goose, the story of a modern Robin Hood. I have been here. The 
The Grey Goose, Adventures of a Modern Robin Hood. Revenge is sweet, I thought, as Barbara and I managed to dispose of those who, just for a short time, had hoodwinked us. And filled with these pleasant thoughts of revenge gratified, I was startled to hear the raucous tones of a newspaper man yelling his headlines in the street below my window. I went down to my front door to get uh, a closer listen to my friend the newsboy. Fortunes made overnight. Here, paper boy. Here you are, sir. Last edition. Oh, tough. Sensational stock exchange gamble. Millions of final editions. Sensational stock exchange news. Back in my rooms, I read the front page news. Just another victory for a big financial group. Simply put, they had declared a dead loss and a complete dry up of oil in the rising sun venture. Thousands rushed to sell at any price. It appears, I'm quoting now, Mr. Henry J. Markham, a director of Rising Sun, was convinced that oil had not petered out. He endeavoured to restore confidence by buying up large holdings wherever and whenever they came on the tumbling market. Mr. Markham's confidence was rewarded overnight, as definite indications are now manifesting themselves that oil is by no means absent from Rising Sun. <laughs> Reading this, the name of Markham rang a bell. So next evening, I buzzed the flat Barbara occupies at the back of mine. Hello? Is that you, Rowley? Yes. Well, I'm glad you're in. Push your button and come through the hole in the wall. I've got something to show you. Well, what's so engrossing in that paper? You really must remember, Barbara, to close that bookcase wall as you come in. Oh, sorry, Rowley. There now. And now... I want you to look at this evening's paper, The Social Gossip. Good heavens. Uh -huh. Something registered, eh? Henry J. Markham, company director and well-known businessman, purchased recently the grand old Georgian manor, Staple Manor in Warwickshire. Inset. A picture of his debutante daughter, Catherine, shortly to be presented at court. Markham. Henry J. Ring a bell? Good heavens, it rings a crashing multitude of bells. Markham was... Yes. Markham was one of the 40 thieves. He was my father's right-hand man. His evidence at the time practically put my father in jail. But it was lies. Lies, lies. Most people didn't think so, but I do. Thank you, Rowley. I think after reading last night's paper, it's time we crossed another name off your list. Markham? Guest in one, my dear. Markham is our next call. And if possible, Master Henry J. will be made to toe the line. Yes, I think from the latest news, the Grey Goose would like to see him. So it's he for Warwick, the home of the Mar of Avon, and that rather more unworthy citizen, Henry J. Markham. What do I do? This, my favourite actress. Scanning through the ads, I find they're short of chambermaids at Staple Manor. You are going to get the job, and after that we shall put into practice certain, um, malpractices, and achieve, I hope, the downfall of one more of your father's rotten crew of scoundrels. Thank you, Rowley. <laughs> You look a peach in that cap and apron. <laughs> I suppose the first footman and the chauffeur have all made passes at you. Being a chambermaid with the low stairs wolves in every nook and cranny is no fun, believe me. Even the senile butler of 60-odd is looking for new places to pinch. <laughs> well, confound it, you're quite an eyeful even in this pale moonlight. Now, let's be serious. How's the fair Catherine Markham? A dreadful little... I know the exact word you're looking for, and I'm glad. Glad? Yes, because my intentions towards her won't go so much against the grain. What do you intend? A little matter of kidnapping, my dear. Kidnap? But you... Yes, and that is why you are first chambermaid in Staple Manor. Now listen carefully. Here are your instructions. Here, in this glass tube, is an incendiary powder. Incendiary? Oh, not much, but very effective. Used very extensively by the Germans when they tried to burn down London. Here also is a coil of wire attached to a fairly good dry battery. Weighs about half a pound. Anything else? 
I'm not Samson, you know. No, there's nothing else. What do I do with it? The simplest thing in the world. Tomorrow at, uh, shall we say, midnight, you will make a tiny heap of the powder outside Catherine's door. Yes. You will just join the open and bare ends of these wires and place them in the pile. So. Check. You will previously take the battery to your own room. What happens then? What happens, she asked. <laughs> the balloon goes up. Actually, you touch the battery with your loose ends, you'll cause a spark at the other end, and that will ignite the incendiary powder. And I burn down Staple Manor. That's fine. Oh, no, no, no. You will not be so dashed wholesale. Now, how far is your room away from the so-and-so Catherine's? Oh, uh, only up a short staircase. About 20 yards. Good. Now, my dear, you're watching from your little staircase. Immediately, wind up your wire, wrap it round your waist, and yell blue murder. Fire! Murder! Thieves! And anything else you can think of. You must rouse the house and set a good example by rushing out into the grounds. And remember one thing. Cling to Catherine like a leech so that I'll know her. Now, repeat the lesson after me so that I can be sure you know your part. I roll the wires from Kathleen's door up to my staircase. Quarter past midnight. I hope Barbara has remembered everything. Good girl. My hat, how that girl can scream. Most disconcerting under some circumstances, but terribly useful just at the moment. This should be my cue to enter the grounds as rescuer. Here, though, and what not? Hello, hello. What's going on there? What's going on? Well, all right, all right. Everybody out on the lawn as soon as possible. Come on, outside all. Very sick, Mrs. On its floor. Oh. What do you men think you're doing? The whole house will burn down in a minute. Idiots. Oh, you. Oh, you wretched idiot. Charming creature. All right, Miss Kate. Good work, Barbara. Hold me at the flat tomorrow. I'm grabbing the charming lady. Uh, come on, miss, away from these sparks. You might catch fire, you know. How dare you touch me like that? How dare... Scream not, my charming Kate. Kiss me, Kate. This is your Petruccio. Just my scarf over your head, so... I beg your pardon. <laughs> my hat, you're strong. Well, praise be, I'm stronger. Come into the car, you... <laughs> <coughs> Must I tie your hands? <coughs> All right, then. <coughs> ah, ah, ah. Now, in you go now. <coughs> and, Kate, don't try any tricks, because I'm a very nasty person when I'm frustrated. <laughs> Sorry this is a car not worthy of you, but as a hire and drive yourself, it'll suffice. <coughs> now we're on the way. Would you like me to unwind that scarf and thus enable you to ask me what this is all about? Just nod your head. <laughs> the answer being in the affirmative, we will undo the scarf after I have placed this little crepe mask on my own face. Good. Now, don't wriggle. If you will a promise, in addition, not to attack me in any way, I'll release your hands also. <coughs> I promise, for the time. Who the devil are you? And what is the meaning of this, this outrage? And why have you abducted me, you punk? One question at a time, fair Kate. Who the devil... I think you said devil. I did. I thought so. Who I am is easy. I am the grey goose. Who is he? Oh, first score to you. Your second question, why have I abducted you? Well, why? A little matter of justice, my dear, all of which will be made patent to you in due time. Why do you wear that idiotic crepe mask? Kate, you are quite a plucky girl, and I wish I knew more of you. But I can't, at this juncture, let you see my face. So let us say I wear the crepe effect in mourning for my personality. You know, you can't get away with this. Aren't these supposed to be stupid, senseless things? True. <laughs> All too true. Perhaps I should have called myself a fox. You're not cunning enough for a fox. Huh? You think not? No. You see, when you forcibly dragged me through the main gate, I managed to release the cord of my dressing gown and left it there. The devil you did. You haven't heard the worst yet. I've dropped each of my bedroom slippers, one by one, out of the window of the car. Hmm. That leaves a trail, doesn't it? <laughs> it certainly does, for two miles of the way. <laughs> Clever, Kate. <laughs> oh, shut up laughing like that. I should have thought you'd have been scared of being followed. Scared? <laughs> Kate. Clever Kate. 
We are driving 25 miles at least, you and I. You are garbed in dressing gown. Very charming, too. And pajamas, even more so. Kate, if you're going to carry on leaving a trail, <laughs> I'm going to enjoy this drive more than I anticipated. <laughs> oh, you impertinent beast. I'll... 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 Oh, take your hands away, you little idiot. You'll have us in the ditch at any moment. I'll have that mask off you if it's the last thing I do. Oh. You... All right, all right. You ask for it. No. <sighs> Oh, thank goodness I managed to pull the car up before you wrecked us. You slapped me. I did. And by so doing, probably saved our lives. If you're going to continue like this, I shall not be so particular where I slap you next. You unutterable beast. My father, if ever he catches you, will jail you for this. And I'll come and see you and gloat. I do not think so. I think maybe it'll be the other way round. What do you mean? Sorry, I can't say just now. But Kate, take it from me. It won't be me whom you'll see in jail. Now, Wedge, are you going to behave? No. I'm getting out of this car this minute, and if necessary, I'll walk home. You will not, in bare feet. And if you don't behave, you walk my way, tied to my door handle by this cord round your wrists, while I drive in comfort at a steady few miles per hour. Oh, you, you cur. You wouldn't dare. My dear girl, for the cause I serve, I would dare anything. Have you no pity, no feeling at all? Yes, I have. Sorry as I am to do this to you, it is dictated by pity and feeling. Pity for those of whom I think you've never heard. Oh, stop talking and drive on to wherever we're going. And remember this, you idiot of a goose, grey or hummingbird coloured. You pay dearly for this and the devil take you. Listen again to the adventures of Roland Fletcher, alias the Grey Goose, the story of a modern Robin Hood. I have been here. The Grey Goose. Adventures of a Modern Robin Hood. This rather goes against the grain. I've abducted a young lady. You see, Henry J. Markham is obviously a stock exchange rat. He's rigged an oil whale by what I consider foul means, leaving shareholders completely in the soup. How many, I cannot even guess at. False surveys and essays, and bing, the shares dropped to nothing. Panic by holders, quick sales, and terrible losses. And then, hey, presto, says Mr. Henry J., there is really oil. And the said Henry J. clears millions. However, let me continue. I've abducted Markham's daughter Catherine by a little ruse, and have driven her to a small cottage I own on the Great North Road. Well, Kate, you are very welcome to this humble abode, and I hope that for as long as is necessary, you will find it comfortable. The devil take you and your cottage. Kate, beshrew me, you are a shrew. Stop <laughs> fooling, you idiot. And tell me why you have brought me here. Later, my dear. In the meantime, make yourself at home. Help yourself to the milk and bread, cheese and honey. I don't want your food. Take it yourself. And that. And that. Three shots and no target, Kate. Don't call me Kate. I hate it. So do I. Catherine is so much more attractive. All right, Catherine, it shall be. Now, look, Maria, this little piece of abduction is not my style, nor my idea of fun. Oh? I thought you reveled in getting a house into a panic with a phony fire alarm and then dragging a defenseless woman away in the dark. You wretched card, why can't you come out in the open? And for heaven's sake, take that silly mask off your face. I'd like to do that, Kate. What? Sorry, Catherine, but I just can't. I'll tell you, however, if you wish, why you've become the heroine of an abduction act. Go on, tell me. Please. Please. Confound you, please. Thank you. Well, it's a long story. And when I've done telling it, you may, may, I said, change your mind about several things. Even me, your bête noir, your abductor. Oh, you're a hard luck case. I've abducted the daughter of a rich man and are going to blackmail him into the means of getting his daughter back. How right you are. I thought so. 
How much? Not so fast. I am not a hard luck case. Far from it. Indeed, I can modestly claim I have sufficient for my needs. At the same time, I can't deny that behind all this there is a soupçon of uh, extortion and uh, blackmail. That's what I said. I also said how much? Millions. What? Millions and more. Hmm. I think I heard you the first time. Good. Now what? Exactly. Now what? And that brings us to reason. 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 There is no reason, damn it. My dear shrew, that's another plate gone. Let's see, that will be millions plus three plates and one glass. A reasonable total Oh, shut be... up! I'm cold and hungry and... and frightened. <laughs> Sorry, my dear. I really am. Don't be frightened. What I've done, I had to do. Maybe it was the wrong way of doing it, but I hope before long to release you, apologize, and return you unharmed to your father. How? With your help. Mine? You're mad. No, only a little enthusiastic, shall we say. Now, can I tell you the story, or a little of it? Go on. I suppose you lie like blazes. No. And will you kindly remember that you are the eminent Miss Catherine Markham, first row, upper ten, daughter of that fabulous king of finance, Henry J. Shut up and get on with your bedtime story. Well, once upon a time... Mm, thought so. That's crazy. Now you shut up. There was a time when a very respected and wealthy man became chairman for an equally wealthy syndicate. Unfortunately for our chairman, members of his syndicate were not exactly, um, square. By juggling and other means, they amassed fortunes at the cost of thousands of poor little subscribers, smallholders. The law stepped in somewhat too late, and the chairman, an honest man, mark you, took the rap, excuse the term, and went to jail for 12 years. Poor sap. Yes, poor sap. Brian Faversham, heard of him? No. Have you heard of Henry J. Markham? My father. Yes, your father, my dear. Great mogul today on the stock exchange. Well? He was one of those whose false evidence sent Brian Fabisham to jail. Liar. A few days ago, Rising Sun Oil stopped rising and fell to billions. Listen, will you? I'm not interested and I don't care a hoot whether the Rising Sun rose or did a nosedive. And you don't care if Catherine Markham has a car and silks and satins and three meals a day? Including, of course, some... Caviar, salmon, and chicken Maryland at the Ritz. Oh, sorry, am I making you pickish? I, I am hungry. Good. This story go, will go well on an empty stomach, because you messed up all the food we have here and nothing's left. No. To continue, the rising sun oil fell to nothing. So Mr. Henry J. Markham came to the rescue and bought up all the little people's shares at roughly nothing. Good business, isn't it? Excellent for Mr. Markham because the shares next day rose like the morning sun. How? How? How, I ask you? I wouldn't know. How should I? But your father knew. How? Because, my dear, the rising sun fell first because a mining expert in his employ, an assayer, stated and certified a dry-up of the well. Crash. Bang. And after the bang, a gusher. A new well came good. It stinks. My word, it does. Of very bad oil. How do you think it smells in the nostrils of those little people? Pensioners, gentle old clergymen, old maids with hardly a mite, young married couples starting life who invested their little all in rising sun. What is it all to do with me? Aha. Now we have reached the crux of the situation. That is, you. You are, I take it, the only child and apple of your father's eye? Yes. Well then, let's be blunt. Adam doesn't get his apple back until he makes complete restitution. I see. I'm the uh, worm on the hook. <laughs> A terrible idea, Mr... I didn't catch your name. Call me the Grey Goose. My card, Kate. A feather. A Grey Goose feather, my dear. Now, enough of this. What's the name of that surveyor, that jackal who licks your father's boots to the extent of issuing phony assays? Come on, girl. Who is he? I don't know. You do? Rumour has it you're half engaged to an up-and-coming mining engineer. Come clean, Kate, come clean. And I might find a little store of food somewhere in the house. I never wanted to be engaged to him. I don't even like him. Better and better. His name, and I can promise you, almost a pork chop. Oh, you devil. For a pork chop, I'd even give you the name of my dressmaker. All right. It's Jacob Marley. Thank you, Kate. You know, you're very charming when you smile and forget you're a shrew. I am not a shrew. 
And now the chop, please. All in good time. You see, there's the food cupboard, and here's the key. But stay, Kate, stay. I have to leave you in a moment, but don't attempt to leave this cottage when I've gone. I definitely will. And walk back 25 miles in bare feet? I'll summer ride. <laughs> You'll get plenty in that dressing gown and pyjamas. <sighs> okay. And there's another good reason why you won't attempt to escape. Just a moment. Sheriff! Sheriff! <whistles> Here, boy. <whistles> all right, all right, all right, all right, quiet. A dog. A very understanding dog. An Alsatian. Hates women. Wise fella. You, um, got the idea? I think so. Well, I'll stay put. Fine. Make yourself at home. I shan't be away long. Why do you call your dog Sherry? Because he's a terrible headache to most. Who? <laughs> Where are you going? To see Mr. Jacob Marley. Au revoir, Kate. Au revoir. <laughs> Patricia. So, you've left Mr. Markham's employ, Barbara. Yes. I told him the fire had frightened and upset me so much I could keep my situation no longer. And what did he say? He agreed. Oh, Rowley, he was distraught at the absence of his daughter. He's no idea she was kidnapped? None at all. He's just bewildered. Almost imagined she was burnt in the fire. The fire? It was only a spit. No fear. It destroyed her room entirely and most of the passage. Quite a show, I can tell you. Oh, Rowley, if you'd seen that man almost beside himself with grief. You're sorry for him? Not really. After all, he's the cause, or largely the cause, of Dad's trouble. No, I'm not sorry, but... But I'm sorry we had to descend to kidnapping. That poor girl. That poor girl? Oh, oh. Barbara, have you ever run into a wire brush or a hedge of blackberries? <laughs> no, but I see what you mean. And now what? A little excursion, my dear, to Adelphi Terrace. Adelphi Terrace? Who lives there? One Jacob Marley, a mining surveyor and a sayer. You going in for mining, Rowley? Let us call it undermining, shall we? Mr. Markham, for instance. Uh, shall I come with you to Adelphi? Ah, it's not a bad idea, now I come to think of it. Yes, Barbara, hop into your flat, change it to something dark, and join me in ten minutes. Right. See you downstairs. <laughs> Delphi Terrace, home of J.M. Barry and many other famous literati of England. Barry was Scotch. True, in a way, Barbara. But he'd hate your way of saying it. Barry was not Scotch. That's whiskey. Barry was a Scot. Oh, sorry, Mr. Barry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, here's Jacob Marley's place. Let's reconnoiter. Into the doorway, Barbara. Let's try Charlie Austin's little gadgets on this door. Good. We're in. By courtesy of Charlie Austin once more. Now, along the passage to number 17 and Mr. Jacob Marley. Do you think he'll be in? At 3 a.m.? He'll be in bed like all bad boys. And heaven knows he's very bad. Now, once more, the keys. Good. Not a sound. Barbara, you stay in the passage and keep KB. If by any mischance someone should come along, jump in here and close the door quietly. Got it? Check. Here goes. Nothing but silence. Jacob doesn't seem to snore. Ah, bedroom, I think. I wonder if J friend Jacob's asleep. Try the switch. <gasps> Why? Heavens. Oh, I'll have to get that poor girl in. Confound it, I can't help it. I must have a witness in case. Barbara. Yes? Close the door and come in here. Right. What's wrong, Rolly? <gasps> oh. Jacob Marley. Dead. Stabbed. Oh, no. Oh, Rowley, do you see? Do you? Yes, I see. A grey goose feather. Oh, Rowley. This adventure of Roland Fletcher is yet to be further told in the next episode of The Grey Goose.